so welcome everybody to today's Televisor webinar, Shouting Into the Void. So happy to see you here and to welcome our presenter, Katie, Kate, Dr. Katie Freund. Katie is the Technology Enhanced Learning and Teaching Manager at the ANU Medical School. She leads a team of learning designers and technologists at Australian National University to create online resources, manage education technologies and lead learning design projects. So she's very well placed to lead us today in a discussion about student engagement in online synchronous classrooms. And to help us answer the question of whether we are shouting into the void. Welcome, Katie. We're so happy to, to, to have you here. Thank you so much, Penny. That's so lovely. I was delighted to be asked. Can everyone hear me okay? Feel free to chat um, at any point um, in the chat bar um, on the right hand side. Thumbs up from Kate. Thank you. Um, so as Penny mentioned, uh, my name is Katie Freund. Um, I have my preferred pronouns there, she and her. Um, and I'm located in Ngunnawal country. Um, I've put a photo of myself there partially so that you can get a sense of me as a human person and not just a little talking head. Um, it's a very good photo, so I like to show it as much as possible. Um, I encourage emails or anyone to message me on Twitter if they would like to do so. Um, and before I get too far into their presentation, I would like to make an acknowledgement of country. Um, I like to share this photo from right behind my house um, because I think it gives a kind of sense of place and scope and history and embeddedness in the landscape that I like to think about when I think of an acknowledgement of country. Um, so this is Ngunnawal country, um, otherwise known as Canberra in the ACT. And I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging and thank them for their custodianship of the land. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of my home country, uh, the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga of the Credit people, um, First Nations people of Southern Ontario. So thank you to uh, all of those. And um, I would love for you to share in the chat what country you're on and share where you are coming from. So please feel free to do that. Okay, so um, the plan for this session is to address these sorts of five key areas. So um, this started from a blog post that I wrote that Penny um, read, which is around um, kind of the impact that Zoom teaching when no one has their cameras on has on academics. Um, and so I'd like to discuss that and reflect on that and then look at some of the factors as to why um, students do or do not use cameras in online synchronous teaching and then kind of discuss how we can address that. And on top of that, basically look at some alternatives to synchronous online teaching. Um, so if you want to discuss anything a bit more than that, please feel free to let me know in the chat. Um, so I kind of like to start small and look at the specific issue of camera usage in synchronous online teaching and then build up over the course of the session to get a little bit radical. So I hope that's okay. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. I can see everyone sharing their wonderful um, acknowledgements of country. Um, so um, this is a photo that I think represents this question of shouting into the void quite well. Um, so this is a group of um, students uh, at the medical school with a facilitator and they're doing a dual delivery, which ANU it uses the word dual delivery to refer to online and um, face to face students simultaneously. Um, other places call it hybrid, etc. So you've got four students on Zoom whose cameras are off and none of the students are looking at them, the facilitator's not looking at them, um, and it's quite, the students on Zoom um, are often assumed to not be engaged because they sit silently. Um, I'd love to hear if anyone has a similar experience as a facilitator, a learning designer, a trainer, um, a, a, a facilitator of meetings, if you have had this similar situation, so please feel free to pop that in the chat as well. Um, 
Yeah, I um, I thought it would be quite common. Um, as soon as I mentioned the topic, people were like, oh yeah, that happens to me every day. <laughs> um, before we get into what students do, I'd love to hear what you do as education professionals. When you're in meetings, do you have, or virtual classes, do you have your cameras on or off? And I'd love you to say why in the chat. Um, so if you tend to have it off, what, what are some of the reasons why you have your camera off um, or on? Yep, so um, I see a lot of people say they have their camera on. Kim says that she has hers off so that she can concentrate and the camera off due to bandwidth. On camera signals presence and reciprocity. Almost always on, except if I'm eating lunch. Thank you, Francesca, that's me too. So a lot of people are mentioning bandwidth. Sorry, I'm just reading the chat. I like to have it on, but I'm often multitasking. <laughs> uh, it depends on the circumstances. Off if I'm not adequately groomed. Rosemary, I, I feel you. Karina, if I have a choice, I have it off. That's an excellent point. Okay, so let's just reflect on that a little bit while we move to the next kind of discussion point. So if you are a facilitator of a session and you're trying to engage people online, have you ever been in that situation where you face a room of black squares and no one has their cameras on and people aren't using their microphones? What does that feel like as a facilitator or a leader of meetings when people have their cameras off? <laughs> Makes me feel dead. Oh, Cassandra, I, yep, I like that. Feels like an echo chamber, isolated, disheartening. Um, talking to myself, not engaged. Yeah, a lot of very similar words here. Can't connect, bored. I feel like a podcast host. <laughs> Karina, you and I should start a podcast. I would listen to that. Um, yeah, wonderful. I prefer them on, but I don't mind. Holly, thank you. Yeah, so it kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Karina, we'll definitely get the podcast going. Send me a message. It'll be great. Um, so the impact of not having cameras on somewhat emotional it's an emotional impact now unfortunately gifts don't play in blackboard collaborate but it's not really um necessary oh gisella i really like that i get really tired trying to keep my energy up i really relate to that it does feel like shouting into the void hence the name of this session um and the the emotional impact can't be understated because or sorry, shouldn't be overstated. No, it, it, it's a lot. I, it's a, words are hard right now. Um, the emotional impact is really important is what I'm trying to say, because it, it leads to how you feel about teaching, how you feel towards the other participants. I agree with a lot of the comments that people have said. I also feel sometimes a bit frustrated, like I'm putting all this energy and I have my camera on. Why don't you? And that um, doesn't sometimes it doesn't feel fair. <laughs> Um, and so that's the issue that I really want to dive into today. So the first thing I want to mention just before we get into a few activities is a tiny bit of the theory about engagement. Um, now, I like to use this quote from Supreme Justice Potter Stewart about everything. It does refer to obscenity originally, an obscenity trial in the United States, but he said, I know it when I see it. So what is engagement? Well, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And I think we can all, we know that feeling of engagement. We see active chat, we see smiling faces, we feel good, there's lots of conversation back and forth. But I think it's important to note that a lot of, um, yeah, Wendy, I know it when I feel it. That's great, I really like that. Um, some of the literature, and I've just done a preliminary scan, so forgive me, it's not um, publication ready. But a lot of the literature talks about how the concept of engagement is somewhat under theorized. And also the existing literature focuses on engagement from the teaching staff's perspective and not necessarily the student's perspective. Um, and I think I find, I found this particular perspective from Leslie Gourlay particularly appealing because 
she talks about the tyranny of participation, which is the best title I've ever heard. Um, where being silent and listening and thinking are seen to be passive and therefore not engaged. And I really, I found myself very challenged by her perspective that there's somewhat of an orthodoxy of what participation should be. That if you are quiet and nonverbal and it, your engagement is not quote unquote visible, then you are somehow disengaged. Um, and I really like um, Wendy's point, what about lurkers? Yeah, a lot of people prefer to listen. I have some, some excellent colleagues who um, often uh, don't like to talk, but are highly engaged. And I also like to think about them when I'm, when I'm doing teaching. Oh, that doesn't look right. Does that look weird for everyone else? Let's try again. That does look okay. weird for us, but we can see that it says presence is not equal to it says presence does not equal engagement and lurking does not equal disengagement yes sorry i don't know why that slide looks a bit funny but essentially i'd like us to bear in mind this idea that being physically present does not mean that you're engaged um for example your camera might be on and i might be making a listening face but i'm actually looking up recipes for dinner or tweeting or taking notes or answering my emails um the other idea is that if you're lurking, you are disengaged. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You can be quietly reflecting, but highly engaged. Okay, so it's a screen of black boxes. And I think what I'd love is just to look a little bit closer at this image because the black boxes say why those people have their cameras off. Low bandwidth, my kid is here, I'm stressed. My webcam is broken, I'm in bed, I'm shy, I'm in the bathroom, I have phoned in, etc. Um, and this is a great image from a blog post that I will reference later um, as well. So um, I'll come back to that. Okay, so according to the literature, these are the reasons from a very large undergraduate biology cohort during the first semester of COVID. Um, these are reasons why the students listed that they don't have their cameras on. So they're not comfortable seeing themselves. They're not in a suitable location poor internet access, worried about distracting the class, no other students had their cameras on or so didn't see the reason. So I'd like to go through each of these in a bit of detail. And now is the time, Penny, if you could share the link to the Padlet, that would be greatly appreciated, excuse me, greatly appreciated. Sure. Because I'd actually- I suppose to imagine you. the I, chat, everybody. Yeah. I'd really like us to crowdsource some solutions so that the Padlet can be a bit of a resource going forward that you could share with others or peek into to see, oh, I'm having a conversation with an academic or I'm teaching myself and I don't know what to do to deal with low, bad internet access from my students. So um, I really want all of you to contribute to this as much as you like. There's columns for each of the topic areas we're gonna discuss. And the final column is just any other suggestions, ideas, resources you would like to share. So please feel free to pop in and do that now. Okay, so I'd like to reflect a little bit on each of these issues. And while we talk about it, so this is the first key point. Um, students are, note that they're not comfortable seeing themselves on camera. And while you, while we chat, I'd love for you to add your ideas to the Padlet about how to address this, and we'll talk about those. So please feel free to multitask. Okay, the reason that um, there's actually a lot of academic literature around Zoom fatigue, which I was very grateful to hear because when I Googled Zoom memes, there were millions, um, which I have included a large number of in the presentation about the impact that having to stare at your own face all day has on you. So some of the literature in the kind of psychology sphere talks about how our brains have to work harder in a video call compared to face to face in order to process facial cues, body language. And the performative aspects of it are more stressful on the body and on your kind of emotions and on your cognitive load. And even a very slight delay of 1.2 seconds, according to Schoenberg et al. that I've cited there below, 
causes you to perceive the other person as less friendly, less approachable, less engaged. And that's just kind of a turn-taking linguistic issue. Um, and I know I do this a lot where I, I, I'm looking at the presentation, then I'll occasionally look straight at the camera to make sure that how I look. <laughs> so that's really nice. All right. So um, let's have a think about what could be done to address this. And I'm seeing, and I'm just going to turn to my other monitor here to, to look at the Padlet, and I'll share some of the ideas there. Some, oh wow, fantastic suggestions. Um, so the main one is to turn off self view, which is, com which is common to most of the different platforms that you might use where you don't have to look at yourself. And I have started doing that recently and it's made a huge difference for me personally um, in order to um, be able to just have a break. Um, yeah, re reassure students it's not about appearing online. It's not TikTok, that's useful. Um, how to use your camera properly, upload a profile photo instead so you still see a face, but it's not a live camera. Um, show students how to hide self view. Um, oh, this is beautiful. This is a wonderful comment. Someone wrote, except that some students may be too distressed by seeing themselves on camera due to anxiety, self-esteem, or body dysmorphia, and then provide adequate accommodations. That really hits the nail on the head for a lot of these. Um, and the other one I would add is to incorporate scaffolding up to having cameras on. It's a strategy that I've started using now where I start with right in the chat, and then the next step is turn your camera on for just a very short time and then turn it off again and encourage a kind of normative behavior where we're reflective about how cameras are used. Um, and um, yeah, regular breaks. And for people to only turn their cameras on when they're speaking, because staring at faces as they stare at something else, I think is not as relevant. Oh, thanks, Meg. Good strategies. Yeah, great strategies from everyone. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Vanessa and Meg. Um, yeah, just having to stare at yourself all day is exhausting, and I find it adversely affects my mental health. So <laughs> please feel free to add more things to the Padlet. Um, I would feel free to add all your suggestions there, and we'll look at it in more detail. But I'll just pop on to the next slide, if that's OK. Um, the other key factor um, is that students aren't in a suitable location. Um, and anyone who follows me on Twitter knows I'm a big fan of Drag Race, and this um, this meme really summed it up, this idea that you're getting peek into private spaces. So students are now working from home, participating from home, and it makes it more and more difficult to have that professional, the boundary between professional and personal has collapsed, and also the boundary between public and private spaces. It's a very gray area. Um, and also to note that there is a privilege component to having access to a private study space. So um, this wonderful um, paper from Reich et al. talks about students from low socioeconomic backgrounds having to participate in online teaching where cameras were mandatory from the bathroom, from the sitting on the toilet with the seat down, because it was the only place in the house that they could have privacy because they live with an extended family, grandparents and small children and so on. Um, so I think it's really useful to bear that in mind and not assume that having a camera off means that they're disengaged. Um, there may be a million um, reasons why that's not the case. So looking to the Padlet now, um, some suggestions are around finding suitable other locations, such as libraries or other campus spaces that people could use. Um, blurring the background or using a virtual background are excellent strategies. I think a lot of students just don't know that they can do that. Um, I find that quite helpful. Um, yeah, sitting on your bed is very embarrassing. Uh, yeah, I would not want my coworkers to see me sitting on my bed. I would find that very invasive. But if I'm privileged enough to have a home office, um, and so that's, yeah. Um, the other one I want to mention is not necessarily around what we do in the technology, but how we facilitate a Zoom session that 
could have an engaging component without using cameras. So for example, um, having interactive activities like we're doing right now, where we're chatting and using Padlet, and it, from my perspective, it feels a little bit like a conversation, but no one has their cameras on. At least not, I can't, I, I can only see Penny. <laughs> um, and so how you teach a session, taking this into account. Um, wonderful, okay. The, the next issue is around causing distractions. Um, and this meme I relate to very much because I do have a toddler at home and he is always trying to sit on my lap and type while I'm trying to be in meetings or teach. It's very stressful. <laughs> And thus, people who have caring responsibilities are disproportionately affected by this. Um, I'm sure we all have children, co-workers with children, pets. Um, I spend a lot of time staring at my colleague's cat. It's a beautiful cat um, because the cat just jumps right up on the desk and starts rubbing itself on the webcam. Um, so in some sense, students are try trying to be considerate by leaving their cameras off. They're actually not wanting to disrupt the class. So they leave their cameras off for the benefit of everyone else. Um, Tara, I also love feeding everyone's children and pets. Um, I just wish a little bit more control over it. <laughs> um, wonderful, okay, so in terms of some theory or some strategies, pardon me, for avoiding distraction, there are some really excellent ones in the Padlet already. So design for blended. Use synchronous targeted for activities that can't be self-paced. I think that's a really critical part, and we'll discuss that in more detail later. Um, and taking breaks, I think, is something that we often are rushing to get through the content, so we don't take any breaks. And I think this could be really helpful for some students. Another strategy that I was thinking of in the context of a busy person who is distracted by home things at home is to ensure that a script or your transcript or your notes are made available beforehand so that if they miss something they can quickly go back and look at what they missed in their own time or provide things like um, um, closed captions or transcripts um, or some if someone misses an extended part of a class like alternative activities um, the other thing would be to talk to the class about it and say, hey, everything's terrible. It's a pandemic. Um, distractions happen, and I don't want you to worry about it. Um, so making it safe um, for students to know that that is just a normal part of life and it can happen to anyone. So it just relieves their anxieties. Um, I'm just looking at the chat now, and I also love seeing yep, everyone's uh, kids and pets. Francesca, I really appreciate the humanization of the conflation between public and private. It's good for us to see lectures as humans. That is beautiful. I, that's kind of the whole philosophy behind this session is actually to just build empathy. Um, in my, if I make it personal for a moment, in my day-to-day -day life as a tell professional i hear a lot of critiques from academics about students they're lazy they're not engaged i try so hard and nobody cares which reflects i think a larger issue with higher education we don't have time to get into right now but that assumption that um students are disengaged is I think quite harmful. And if we take it from this perspective where we do, we build that empathy into our teaching from the beginning, I think it can make a real difference. Pardon my soapbox, I will now step down from there. Oh, a five minute meet the pets session. Oh, Vanessa, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. I'm gonna do that from now on. <laughs> I've taken that, put that in the Padlet, Vanessa. I think that's a great way to to incorporate it is to just say, yeah, here's my cat. She's gonna probably lick the webcam, enjoy. <laughs> here's a photo of my toddler, say hi. Okay, the next issue is around internet access. And I noted that this was a concern for many of you. Um, 
Oh, Karina, combine the strategies. Have pictures of your pets as their photo. Genius. Yeah, I love that. Um, internet access in Australia can be quite poor outside of major cities and even in major cities. Um, and it's a critical issue to compel students to have cameras on. Um, so I took this quote from Kathy Stone and Monica Davis's excellent blog post on the stark inequality of online access for rural and remote students. So I'm in Canberra and Goulburn is about an hour down the, down the highway. It's a sizable inland city. And this was a quote from a student studying university there. I cannot access Zoom because of how unreliable my internet is. It often cuts out or is incredibly delayed. Oh, okay, yeah, Kathy Stone's stuff is amazing. Everyone should follow her on Twitter and share everything she does. It's amazing. Um, and so this is a, a, a this is very likely where some students at the Australian National University might live in Goulburn because it's just down the road. And if those students are not able to access the Zoom calls, we're essentially in some ways excluding them from being able to participate in the teaching. Um, Penny, if you could pop that link there in the chat as well. Um, thank you. You're right on right on top of it. The other thing to consider is that that's just in Australia. Now, Australia ranks 65th globally um, for average fixed broadband speed. Um, if you are in Australia or New Zealand, have a look at that list and also look at which countries tend to be in the top and which countries tend to be in the bottom. Um, so feel free to just have a look at that right now and get a sense of what kind of the averages are out there. So Europe and East Asia, very high. Uh, Pacific countries, African countries are very low. And essentially this is a key concern for me in terms of if we are compelling students to learn on Zoom, we may be global and regional and rural inequalities. <laughs> um, now, I'd love for us to talk about it in detail. What can you do to address this? So we don't necessarily have control over internet access in rural areas or in other countries, but what can we do to address this internet access issue? So, um, Consider your vote on May 21st. Thank you, Colin. I can't vote because I'm not a citizen, but I'll, yeah, definitely give that a thumbs up. Um, so, yeah, using emoticons, like encouraging people to keep their cameras off and use other modes of reacting, that's a great one. Silent activities like Padlet and Google Docs, providing copies of content beforehand, uploading a photo. Um, Kathy Stone is an advocate for um, regional university study centers um, where students can go to a place in their local area, such as a library or a small campus, to, um, to participate in their classes from there. Um, and the other one, um, oh, Kate, yeah, great. Right. All of those suggestions also help students using mobile devices. That's a perfect point. Um, the other option is, um, again, talking about transcripts. Um, so one of the practices that's become increasingly common at ANU is to have a class in Zoom recorded and then upload that to Echo 360, the university's uh, lecture recording system. And Echo 360 here has automated transcripts included. So that could be another option is kind of low res downloadable um, copy recordings that have transcripts that students can follow um, or be able to just export the transcript and read along rather than necessarily having to watch the entire class. Okay. Um, and I guess the, the other thing I want to highlight is that this is very intersectional. So students don't just have one of these issues. A student could very well be in a remote area, have a child with a disability who requires at-home care, 
and be <laughs> in, um, you know, not have access to appropriate devices and be concerned about having to stare at their own face the whole time. And so it's actually kind of complex and can be easily compounded. And just to add the cherry on top to this um, situation, I'd like to just raise an issue which I discovered very recently and was quite a surprise to me. Um, uh, Penny, could you please put the Padlet in the chat again for Erica? Welcome, Erica. Oh, there. Thank you. Um, so this paper by Obringer et al. from last year was quite um, impactful on me for the environmental footprint of all the bandwidth we're using. So the data has to come from somewhere. I know the Karina the Netflix is pretty shocking. <laughs> um, and so Zoom ranks second after Netflix in terms of environmental cost of video usage. Um, now I want to um, go to this next slide and encourage you to take a minute. I'll, I'll give you a second to do this. Penny, if you could pop the link to this in the chat, that would be great. Thank you. Um, you, can do, you can use this online calculator to see how many emissions you are generating by using Zoom. And, and yes, I think it's all streaming services, Netflix. I don't know what the footprint of Prime versus Disney Plus versus Netflix is, but maybe we can look into that. Someone can research it and let us know. If you click on this link, you go to a website that will help you estimate your carbon footprint um, for using cameras in Zoom. Yeah, but it's, I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and Matthew, that's an excellent point around how much is that emissions compared to driving in your car to campus. I hate to say this, but it's actually um, depending on how many people have their cameras on. So for me, I often go to large classes or large meetings with like 40 to 50 people and they're all expected to have their cameras on. And I do that quite often. And so for me, the footprint was driving, it was around driving 20 miles or so um, equivalent. Um, and so it was quite shocking for me to realize that turning the cameras off could have such an impact. Um, apparently, turning your camera off for one week's worth of Zoom is equivalent to going vegetarian one day a week. <laughs> um, so just a fun fact for you all. Yep, <laughs> Sydney traffic, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, or luckily for Ken Barons, we only have a peak quarter hour instead of a peak hour. Um, there's only traffic for 10 minutes. Yeah, so Elise, you're definitely saving the world. If you're a vegan and you work from home, um, thank you. Wonderful. Okay. I just thought that was an interesting slash depressing thing to consider. And now I'd really like to turn to the crux of the issue around why the, um, why Zoom cameras are off. So there's equity issues, there's access issues, but the one that I think was the most profound and perhaps the one that we could do the most about is that students didn't think there was a reason to have their cameras on. Um, the class was not designed for participation. So students left their cameras off because they didn't feel the need to have them on. There was no purpose. Um, and in that sense, the expectations of the teaching staff and the students are somewhat mismatched. So academics are assuming that students should be participating, but the students don't see the point. Um, so I'd like to spend a bit of time on this particular question. Um, and of course, uh, as, as, as education professionals, this would probably be one of our many mantras, which is if you want students to interact, you have to design for interaction. Um, so I'd like you to take a few more minutes to contribute to the Padlet in the column, there is no reason to turn on your camera. So this is the pedagogical um, suggestions. I did receive a few emails before the session from people saying, well, in my class, um, in my class, people, everyone uses their cameras and it's great. And they explained their, the kinds of activities they do. 
And so if you would like to share those in the Padlet that, or in the chat, that would be amazing. What works? What is Zoom good for? So let's just take a few minutes and look at the Padlet, add some comments, and have a think about it. Okay, I might just um, review a few of the options now. I'm hoping that this Padlet could essentially turn into a great resource for you. So the next time you're helping an academic or designing a class, you have a catalog of strategies that you could talk to. So um, just from the bottom, um, so explain the value of to students excuse me, make it clear why you want them to turn their cameras on and what the benefits are. And also, I like someone wrote, tell the students how much of a difference it makes to the feelings of the teacher they maybe just don't realize. And I think that's a really good strategy is making your expectations clear. I'd like you to turn your cameras on because it helps with this and this and this and this. I'd like you to turn your cameras on because it means a lot to me. I'd like you to turn your cameras on for this section and then you can turn it off after that. Something like that. Um, just that clear communication of expectations I think will make a big difference. Um, turn camera on only when speaking, that's great. Breakout rooms, so small groups have a reason to turn on cameras and then turn it off again. Um, I love this suggestion of the chat bomb slash waterfall. I think that's great and I'm definitely going to use that. So students write their answer in the chat, but don't press send until you tell them to and everyone press sends at the same time and it just gets an explosion of engagement just for a bit of novelty and um, excitement. Um, insist on breakout rooms. Um, telling students there will be quiet times and talking times. Have a quiz. Perfect, just having a quiz activity or charades, that's another great idea to make an option for them to participate without their cameras on. Um, turn your cameras on for less emotive sections. I don't want to cry on camera. <laughs> Introvert, <laughs> um, I, really, uh, I really relate to that. Um, I might suggest a few other ideas around how you add um, asynchronous and synchronous activities together. So potentially having those social spaces on your LMS site or on a social media space for your class where students can get to know each other would build more trust so that when they come to the Zoom session, they're more likely to have their cameras on. Um, Summaries in the chat at the end of class. I think that's excellent. That's a really great idea, Holly. Um, another ac an academic I work with here does a summary video at the end. So she noticed that students weren't watching the recordings and they never were going to watch the recordings. So she just recorded a quick summary of the class and posted that. Um, and she found that those got huge, huge like meeting students where they were. Um, that's for a master's course where all the students are working full time and just doing this kind of out of out of time. Show and tell. Um, a really beautiful story here about supporting students when discussing palliative care. That's an excellent um, an excellent question. I encourage you all to read that one. Okay, so hopefully that's a good pile of resources there um, for you. Um, and this is another GIF that won't play from um, the beautiful Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Um, what if there was another way? <laughs> um, and I suppose we could hypothesize that the reason we all turned to Zoom was because it was an emergency COVID pandemic shift to remote teaching. It was the first option that came to mind. It was the quote unquote closest to face to face. Um, but uh, what if we what if we thought about other options? So um, if I may just get back up on my high horse for a second. 
and I'd love for this to be a bit of a discussion. So I'll introduce the topic and then I'd invite people to have their cameras on or their microphones and share their thoughts on this particular issue. So there were a lot of positives in the change to remote teaching, right? Like I've been in ed tech space for a while. Obviously now it's much more embedded in everyday teaching activities than it ever has been before. Here are some of the positives as noted by Texa um, that were drawn from the remote teaching shift during COVID flexibility, the staff were more active online themselves, um, student support was offered online for the first time where it used to traditionally be face to face, many universities or institutions gave students access to devices, um, and flexibility with assessment. Um, and none of these positive aspects are inherently a result of Zoom or even synchronous. In fact, if you go asynchronous, there is even more flexibility. Now, distance education providers know this. I'm not changing any of their minds because they've been teaching that way for a long time. But something, um, this would be quite radical at ANU. Um, I often hear the Moodle sites are boring. No one's there, no one speaks online. The only way to talk to students is through Zoom. My little uh, rant is around that if you design for interaction and build teacher and social presence, then asynchronous classes can be more engaging and inclusive if you design for it. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Does anyone want to um, raise their hand or write in the chat or take over the mic or the camera for a second and share their thoughts around the balance of Zoom. Um, I'd love to hear some examples of quality asynchronous courses that you've participated in. Um, uh, I suppose um, I'd like to say death to Zoom and wouldn't all of our lives be better if we never had to use it again. Um, what do you guys think? Cheryl? Uh, Penny, are you able to? Yeah. I Cheryl, come. Hello. I have to have my um my um camera off today, but yeah, I'd love to. Please. Yep. Oh, yeah. I, I teach at the Masters of um, Leadership at Deakin University. It's asynchronous. Um, mm -hmm. I started doing it seven trimesters ago, a couple of years ago now, and um, I really enjoy that interaction um it's designed mm. well that's one of the first key points is what is the design that it is a mm. you can develop yeah. because there's so many posts and um you can develop relationships through posts it's been extraordinary for me so that we can have little jokes we do ha ha emojis all sorts of, of different things um it's through future learn so there's lots of um likes which is in the form of a heart which i didn't like when i first started it i definitely wanted a thumbs up but i sort of got really comfortable with that now on top of that we do add some um content with me, me as the educator so we do that through um two pre-record uh, three pre-recorded videos that are walkthroughs for the assessments and then they're uploaded and then there's asynchronous comments being made across that after we complete that for a long period of time. Because the other thing mm. is students have a lot, you know, they can have a really lag time. I can have one student on topic A1 and one student on topic five. So mm. it's challenging for the educator to be across the, the, the movement there. And then we do have some live kick dropping Q&A sessions. So I, mm. I really like it and I find it as engaging with reading and developing those relationships and when i do actually have a face-to-face -face with someone i'm like i already know you you're a well-known student to me so that's yeah the yeah that's a wonderful point cheryl i think um the the idea that you can build those relationships asynchronously is really meaningful to me i i feel like i know a lot of you already from twitter or from other places like that um kind of asynchronous ish where we can, you know, share our lives and get that, um, get that kind of relationship building going. And then when we see each other at conferences or in webinars, it's like, oh, how are you, Karina, Kate, whoever, you know, everyone, it's great to see you again. Um, 
And I also just want to reference um, what Kate actually just put in the chat, which is that online asynchronous requires more deliberate design in advance. And I think that um, that's a really good point. I, I would worry about some of the academics I know realistically having time. I don't know if that time would be something that they could act, actually commit. Um, and, and, and Cheryl, what you were saying about essentially having to teach all weeks of the course simultaneously, I think could be quite overwhelming for someone who is not experienced with it. Um, yeah, great questions. Is there anyone else who would like to use the microphone? We have just a few more minutes. I'm almost done with my part. Katie, raised. I'm happy to yeah. say something, if that's all right. It's Meg from Deakin. Um, oh, hi, Meg. Yeah, please. Yeah, just a quick point. It just relates to a couple of points that are posted in in, um, in the chat. They're, they're separated, but they're um, just it, there's so many teachers who now, in the wake of COVID, thinking like um, they have, if they're not doing the lecture, the traditional lecture, that to protect their work allocation model, that they have to show mm -hmm. something really tangible, like either a, a Zoom synchronous session or a um, video um, recorded as, asynchronous, asynchronously for students' access. Um, and they feel like that they need to do that. So we've got teachers who are producing like 60 small videos for one unit and they feel like that they've got to do that and there's no other choice. Whereas those of us who've been in um, in the academic development slash learning design space for a long time know that as per Kate Mitchell's comment about that there's so many ways that you can create good learning in, in a um, online space that you don't necessarily have to always resort back to those two things. So. I think that there's a need for project. There need, it needs to be a project, um, perhaps at whether you know ASCLA is a vehicle or some other forum, where we put together. Well, what is the equivalence? What is what does an equivalent piece of work look like? And we all know examples, and some of them can be ten or more years old. We know of really good stuff that was happening mm -hmm. that could easily translate as equivalent to that, so that students don't feel. Oh, sorry, teachers don't feel nervous about. I've got teachers and students, so I get mixed up sometimes. <laughs> um, so, you know, so that they feel confident that, yes, I can say that this over here. So perhaps we need to collaborate and write write a project plan around this or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really excellent. I really also like the idea of addressing it more systemically. I'm just pasting a reference into the chat, which may be relevant. I haven't read it in a while, but I think it covers this issue, which is estimating workload allocation models for online teaching. Um, and how that could be done. So there's a resource there for anyone who might want to have a read. Um, yeah, and Meg, I think one of the, the questions that sticks out to me is why is asynchronous not seen as tangible? Like, I, I don't have an easy answer for that, but there's this idea that if it's, you know, in your learning management site or in your, um, uh, if it's taught on social media, it's seen as somewhat ephemeral or not real or empty um, in a way that compiling hours and hours of video is seen as real or authentic. So that's an interesting question maybe to ask ourselves. Um, but yeah, I'd love to um, consider how we could systemically address this issue as maybe Ascalite professionals. Um, so that's a fantastic suggestion. Now, I just am sensitive to the time, so I hope it's all right if I move on. Um, everyone's welcome to continue to right in the chat, but just for the moment. Um, so thank you, Meg. Um, I almost just want to end on a note that um, will not be a surprise to anyone, <laughs> but I almost put this first, but I thought it would be like nice to end on it. We kind of go, well, Zoom is the problem. Cameras are the problem. But I think as we all know, good teaching is good teaching. Um, the principles that make teaching effective face-to-face work online, whether you're synchronous or asynchronous, um, like being inclusive, universal design, taking on board student voices or doing co-design with students, building in flexibility, ensuring that your activities and your assessments and your learning outcomes have constructive alignment, scaffolding, all of those principles are essentially what we've been discussing this whole time. It's kind of the core, the core, um, core usage. Um, 
so um, I might um, uh, wrap up there just because I know a lot of people probably have one o'clocks to get to. Um, I want to say thank you. I'd love to hear more questions. I can stay on for another few minutes if anyone else wants to chat. Feel free to tweet me or email me. My details are there. Um, I love hearing from you and I'd love your feedback on the session as well. Um, and use the Padlet. I'm not gonna take it down, I'll leave it up. Um, you can um, access it in your own time. Maybe we can add the links to the yeah, recording YouTube video um, just so that it is there for you. So now you've got a crowdsourced there are worth uh, 38 contributors to the session. You've got links, you've got suggestions, you've got resources. So in the future, your asynchronous or your synchronous teaching can be as wonderful as it possibly ever could be. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate seeing all of you again. Um, in case anyone needs them, here are the references. I will share the slides. Um, as well, but there's all the, the citations um, that I have used. Um, and here's just a few good resources that are out there um, on this, um, some written by me or by my team um, and some, some other resources there. I think the links in the slides are active, so you can click on the slide and it will open for you. It looks like their links are active, which is very exciting. Um, so have a wonderful day. Slides are active. Okay, I'll send the slides around. Um, oh, some are through A&U's library firewall. My mistake, <laughs> and Vanessa, obviously I copied the wrong link. <laughs> um, thank, thank you, Katie, so much for that wonderful presentation. We're, we're so grateful. You. So grateful to hear. We're so grateful to hear from everybody contributing the beautiful uh, suggestions and strategies in the Padlet. Um, I also note that an Ascolite project and a podcast have also been birthed during this <laughs> session. So that's that's great, a bit more, a bit more work, but a lot more interaction for all of us. And um, I would welcome a query there from Vanessa about Campus Morning Mail. You're very welcome to join the Teams environment uh, where we can certainly um, share the slides there. Uh, so the there's a there's an Ascolite team for Teleadvisors. So uh, we'd we'd love to we'd love to see you there, Vanessa, and anybody else who's interested. Uh, any other comments? Thank you, thank you, Katie, so much, so much to 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 think about there. No problem. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Colin and Hank and uh, Kate and everyone else. Um, wonderful to see you all. I've missed you. Uh, hoping to make it to Ask Light in person later this year. Have a wonderful day. Um, yeah, tweet me. I'll tweet a link to the slides. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.